Without further ado, let me introduce Graham to come talk to you about evil geniuses. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me all right? They want to hear, wow, fantastic. Even the chaps right at the back on table 16. Have I got the number right? There we are. We've, I did manage to visit some of you in advance um, to have a word with you and uh, to get you in the mood for the presentation, which I thought was very important. Because of course, every, well, what do you like? You know, if you're at a Christmas dinner, what do you like? You like to have a PowerPoint presentation at the end of it, don't you? So I think, I think something like a fantastic conference like this, when you have your gala dinner, what you really, really need is a cybersecurity PowerPoint presentation at the end. And thanks to the folks who organized that. Now, so what a terrific idea that was, really terrific. So my name is Graham. I work uh, for myself. Uh, I've worked in the world of cybersecurity for the last 30 years. My goodness. Um, I started off as a programmer writing antivirus software back in the day. Um, worked for a company called Dr. Solomon's. Does if anyone's ever heard of Dr. Solomon's antivirus toolkit or Alan Solomon? Oh, yes, yeah, some of the grey beards uh, have heard of that. Um, Alan Solomon really did exist. Uh, Alan, oh, sorry, does he? Alan, oh, sorry, I've offended some. Uh, it wouldn't be the first time. Um, some, uh, yeah, Alan Solomon really does exist. I actually saw him a few weeks ago. Uh, he's getting on a bit now. Um, but um, yeah, I was hired as maybe a second or third programmer, and I, I wrote uh, the antivirus toolkit for Windows 3.0. Uh, oh yes, there were those. Those were the days. Um, and uh, anyway, they moved me on. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and then I worked for a while for a company called Sophos. Um, I worked for them for many years, and for the last ten years, I've been working for myself. And one of the things I've been doing is I've been doing a weekly podcast about cybersecurity and hacking, um, where I tell you all about the crazy things which are going on in the world of cybersecurity, because I think it matters to everybody, whether you work in IT or not. It matters because you have a computer in your pocket, and you're doing online banking, and you're doing online shopping, or you're on social media, or you're on Instagram, or Elon Musk's Fun Palace, or whatever he's calling it this week. You're all of those places, and scams are happening and you're being conned or your business is getting hit by ransomware, so on and so forth. And one of the things which I've heard time and time again in the 30 years I've been working in this industry is that all oh, those hackers, they're really clever, aren't they? They're really clever. They must be such absolute geniuses. This is what the media is telling you all the time. And I'm going to say piff, paff, poof. That is not necessarily true. I'm not the great Soprendo. I'm not a magician, by the way. If you heard the words piff, paff, oof and got excited, that is going to be misleading. So I'm going to tell you about some of the hackers who sometimes the media has said have been evil geniuses. This group is called Lulsec. And Lulsec were an active hacking group uh, around about, oh, maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, something like that. They were hacking into companies, they were breaching them, they were breaking into social media accounts, they were causing trouble. And what made Lulsec really different from the other hacking groups was that they were actually quite funny. They had someone who was really quite amusing running their Twitter account. And as a result, on Twitter, they had hundreds of thousands of people following them, not just cybersecurity journalists and people like me, but just members of the public, where they would announce their latest hacks and they would say funny things. And so they were quite skilled in some way. Eventually they got arrested and they ended up in trouble that they probably weren't laughing quite so much. But they did amuse me for a while. One day we heard word that a member of Lulsec had been arrested. And here were the front pages of the newspapers when that occurred. We've got the sun, hack the lad. That's very clever, isn't it? Essex Geek 19 arrested for being global cyber villain. The world's number one hacker suspect is Essex boy. Essex teenager linked to a wave of cyber hacking. Uh, police arrest suspected CIA hacker. The police swooped on a teen cyber mastermind says The Independent. And this was a big story right at the time. Here's The Independent. They actually have a photograph on their front page of the hacker's house in Essex. It wasn't just The Independent who were really interested in where this amazing cyber villain lived, but also, of course, the Daily Mail. 
And the Daily Mail, as you know, the one thing that they love more than celebrity cellulite, the thing which they adore more than slagging off Meghan and Harry and the BBC, and obviously Keir Starmer as well, they love to talk house prices. And so they cannot write a story without describing how expensive a house is that somebody lives in. You just take a look. Next time you're... In fact, does anyone read the Daily Mail here? Yeah, right. Scary, isn't it, to admit it um, from the most popular news website in the world. Anyway, the Daily Mail, they love to talk about the price of houses. They love to talk about how things are changing all the time. They love to document whether your house is semi-detached or detached and whether it has an outside swimming pool or how lovely the grass is, whether you have a robot lawnmower, something like that. And they also really love to show you photographs of the inside of a hacker's lair. So let's go in. Let's go in right now. Den, it says, this is a hacker's den. The teenager has two computer monitors. Whoa, we're dealing with some serious stuff here. What kind of evil twisted mind has two monitors? Instantly suspicious, obviously a hacker. Further evidence that this is a teenage hacker's place is that, look what he's done with the window here. He's put tin foil up against the glass and he has an air conditioning unit. Now, any of you who have teenage children, in particular teenage boys, will know the importance of recirculating the air inside their bedroom on a regular basis. So that is a clue. They've got a real enormous extension plug here. And I think perhaps the biggest giveaway that this is a teenage boy at all is the photograph. Thankfully, hopefully at the back, you can't see this too clearly. Um, we have a painting or some sort of lithograph over the monitors of two young women in, I hope they're wearing a thong. It's hard to see whether it's just shadow or not with their bottoms in the air. So you can imagine quite how much that den of iniquity sounds, uh, smells like. So what else is going on here? Well, what the Daily Mail really wants to do and what we want to know is what does this teenage cyber terrorist look like? Well, the Daily Mail has got its team of investigative reporters looking into this case and they have managed to dig out a photograph of the cyber terrorist. Who would like to see them? Well, I'd love to show them. That's the end of my talk now, unfortunately. This is a democracy, so if one person says no, we have to... No, we're going to carry on. Here they are. The face of the teenage... This is 19... Hang on, 19? Ah, they've actually managed to get his school photograph from six years before. So this is a guy called Ryan Cleary. They've managed to get his 13-year-old uh, photograph, uh, which they put up there. And there it is on the front page, the cyber terrorist, the greatest global cyber villain, the world's number one hacker. And according to The Sun, he is nerdy, geeky, reclusive, and an oddball. Now, I'm not one to cast aspersions. I've only just met you guys. Some interesting adjectives there. I would think that maybe about two thirds of us could probably describe ourselves, right? I'm including myself by that determination. But that, that's what the sun is saying. So the sun is slagging off the Lulsec group. They're saying they're a bunch of nerds and geeks and they're reclusive as though a teenage computer programmer could possibly be ever considered to be antisocial and reclusive <laughs> as, if, as if we ever were like that. Well, Lulsec got its revenge because just a couple of days after The Sun published this story, if you went to The Sun's website, this is what you saw. Picture of Rupert Murdoch. Media mogul's body discovered, it says. And there is a new story here about how Rupert Murdoch has ingested a large quantity of palladium. I don't know if it's the London palladium. Maybe they meant polonium. And uh, he has stumbled into the topiary on his garden and he has deceased. He has died. We found the chemicals sitting beside a kitchen table recently cooked, one officer says. From what we can gather, Murdoch melted and consumed large quantities of it before exiting into 
his garden. So an astonishing story. So you think that the Sun's website has been hacked by the Lulsec group. Actually, the website wasn't hacked. Actually, what happened was that the hackers changed the DNS. This is, by the way, is probably going to be the most nerdy part of the talk. Just warn you, if you can't cope with this bit, don't panic. This is as bad as it's going to get. They hacked the DNS records of the website, which meant that when you in your browser wrote thesun.co.uk, you didn't get taken to the IP address where the Sun servers actually are. Instead, you got taken to someone else's servers. So it looked like the Sun's website. It said thesun.co.uk at the top. But in fact, you went to a server which was controlled by the Lulsec hacking gang, where they put up this story and said, this is a hacking technique which we've seen uh, used against different websites. Twitter has suffered this in the past. There was a, a Middle Eastern hacking group who took over twitter.com. Again, not really hacking the website, but hacking the records of the website to create their own headline news. So the media love to hype up that someone is a genius. Someone's the world's number one hacker. The reality is rather different. This is Ryan Cleary, age 19, when he appeared in court. And the point of my talk today is really to do this, is to play a game with you guys. I think we should ask ourselves, are hackers really evil geniuses? And so we're going to play a little game which I like to call Evil or Genius. I don't have a theme tune, so I'm just going to make one up now. Hi, and welcome to Evil and Genius. Hey, everybody, welcome to Evil Genius. All right. OK. I knew handing out the stickers would work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you different people on the screen and we'll see, could they be evil or a genius, all right? So you just shout out whether you think you're seeing someone evil or a genius. So does anyone know who this guy is? OK. Evil, does anyone know what his name is? Is it Dr. Evil? Who is it? Adolf Hitler, absolutely right. Who thinks he's a genius? Correct answer. It's always good to do that little test at the beginning of a talk if there's any neo-Nazis uh, in the audience. Uh, I don't know if any of you have a poster of him up on your walls at home, uh, on the bedroom, instead of a couple of women with their bottoms in the air. But I would say evil, a bad guy. Don't like the evil guys. Right. So we've got one guy with a moustache, and he is evil. Some of you guys have got moustaches. I don't think anyone's got a moustache, but not without a beard. Would that be right? Has anyone got a moustache but no beard? Evil. Oh, there's some finger, finger pointing. Sorry, madam. Are they pointing at you? Um, anyway, okay, another one. Okay, we've, we've worked out here. You've got the idea. Well, let's go again. Anyone know who this guy is? Albert Einstein. Is he evil or a genius? Or is he an evil genius? Ah, I think what you've done is you've used your AI machine learning technology and unfortunately you've corrupted your database by thinking that anyone with a moustache is evil. It's not actually true. Some guys, Albert Einstein, genius, not evil. Okay, another one, crazy moustache. He's gone a bit further with the moustache. Does anyone know who this is? Stalin, absolutely correct. Evil or genius? Evil. Absolutely evil. Okay, um, right now you're thinking, huh, we got this. We've got no problem. This is such an easy game. We're so sort of going to win this. Uh, maybe he's got some stickers he'll land out, something like that. Uh, you're thinking, let's uh, make it a bit trickier. Let's give you two people at once. Boom! Who have we got here on the screen? Who's the guy on the left? Newton, absolutely right. Isaac Newton, the guy who invented gravity. Before then, we were all floating around like crazy. Thank goodness for his invention. And the guy on the right, a Dalek. OK, are we dealing with good or evil here? Newton, genius, good genius, right? Dalek? Neither. Yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry. I hate to correct you, I think you'll find Daleks aren't computers. They're actually Mark III travel machines, and inside there's a great big squiddy car-led mutant inside. 
So I hate to out nerd you. Uh, definitely not a computer. OK, so there we go. We put them into their right categories. Let's get two more. We're doing so well. Who are we representing here? On the left. That's not Davros, by the way. That's Stephen Hawking. Does anyone know who this is on the left then to represent? Leonardo da Vinci, evil or genius for these two? Genius or genii maybe as well. Absolutely correct. All right. I think we're going to go up a level of difficulty. Do you think you can handle it? <laughs> Clippy. Damn right. Damn right. Bill Collins. Come on, come on. It's obvious. It's obvious. Oh, hang on. There's a problem. There's a problem with PowerPoint. Sorry. There we go. Yep. So, I see we've got some prog rock fans in the audience. Um, this is Albert Gonzalez. Albert Gonzalez is the leader of a hacking gang, a gang which hacked into TJ Maxx, as it's known in the States. TK Maxx, it's called over here. He stole over 40 million credit card details. And then he stole a further 130 million credit card details. And the reason why he did that, no, the way he was able to do that was because TK or TJ Maxx, whatever they, I don't know why they call it different letter. What is the point of that? Why have they called it TK Maxx here and TJ Maxx? TJ Hooker, I understand, but it's just, anyway. The way in which he did it was that TK Maxx was using a debunked encryption standard, Wi-Fi encryption standard called WEP, which is easy to crack. You can break into it. It's basically as useful as a, a, a light custard in encrypting your data. You can just scrape it off. And as a result, he was able to steal lots and lots of credit card numbers. He was then, with his gang, able to clone credit cards, go to ATMs up and down the country, take out millions and millions and millions of dollars. Um, and around midnight, one day in July, he got arrested. He was caught stuffing suitcases full of money, which he was cash potting out of ATMs. And he was actually really, really lucky because the FBI, when they got hold of him, they didn't just throw him in the clink. What they did was they said, look, maybe you could help us a bit, not by giving us some of your money. Uh, maybe you could help us a bit because maybe what you could do is you could perhaps tell us about other hacking gangs. So if you kept your ear to the ground and you tipped us off, we will turn a bit of a blind eye to all this naughty stuff which you're doing. And that's what he did. He did this secret deal with the FBI, working undercover on their behalf to learn about other hackers. But the mistake he made, the mistake he made was that he kept on hacking. He kept on stealing millions and millions of credit card details. He stole a further 180 million credit card details after being caught by the FBI, after the FBI knew who he was. So he was already rich, but he couldn't bring himself to stop. So if you ask me, is he an evil genius? I'd say, not really a genius. So that's him. Does anyone know this woman? This is Kemi Badenoch. Let's watch a video of Kemi Badenoch being asked a question. What's the naughtiest thing you've ever done? The naughtiest thing. I, about 10 years ago, I hacked into, oh my God, it's about, I uh, hacked into a Labour MP's <laughs> website. <laughs> no. And I changed um, all the stuff in there to say nice things about Tories. That's nice. Funny, yeah, but I wouldn't name who. <laughs> <laughs> when this video came to light, no, I was interested. I thought, oh, that's interesting. Someone saying that they hacked into a Labour MP's web. I thought, I wonder if I can find out who that was. She says it was 10 years before, and I looked through the archives, and I found this story about how someone hacked into Harriet Harman's website. There's Harriet Harman. She was the deputy leader of the Labour Party back at that time. And her website was hacked and defaced to contain bogus stories saying that she defected from Labour to the Tories, and furthermore, she was going to back some chap called Boris Johnson to be London mayor. 
Now, people said, well, must have been a genius to hack into Harriet Harman's website to do such a thing. Kemi Badenoch, she must be of real elite skills. I would say maybe she didn't need such elite skills to hack into Harriet Harman's website because her username and password was somewhat predictable. So you've got to have sensible passwords and you have to be unique and they have to be strong. So Kemi Badenoch, where is she now? Well, today she's right there. Actually, today she's at the Tory party conference where she's given a talk because she is Secretary of State for Business and Trade. She's a high profile MP. She ran to be Conservative leader when, you know, frankly, they were trying anybody to be Conservative party leader. It's like everyone has a go. It's like pass the parcel with that particular job. Um, she may, she may indeed be Conservative party leader one day in the future. But there she was. So, oh yeah, yeah. Isn't it funny how I broke the law? Um, hacking into someone's website. Say, so not maybe such a good example to give people. Harriet Harman very graciously accepted Kemi Badenoch's apology when this came to light uh, as a result. But if you ask me, is that a genius at work? I'd say, I'm not so sure it is. Here's another person. This is Michael Bowen. Michael Bowen lives in Manila in the Philippines. And his claim to fame is that he was college buddies with a guy called Onel de Guzman. Has anyone heard of Onel de Guzman? Chances are that if you were on the internet 22 years ago, Onel de Guzman sent you an email. On May the 4th, 2000, an email went around the world called the love bug or the I love you virus. Is anyone here old enough other than me to remember the I love you virus? It was bloody huge. It clogged up email systems around the world. And uh, that's what Onel de Guzman, who was Michael Bowen's friend, did. Michael Bowen also wrote viruses. He wrote a virus, a word macro virus, which uh, used Clippy to display messages from Doctor Who and Gilbert and Sullivan and things like that. But it also, at the end of the month, printed out a message. And it said, if you don't give me a stable job by the end of the month, I'm going to release another virus which will remove all the folders on your primary hard disk, or in layman's term, paraconav ring phenormat ang hard disk mo, which I believe is Tagalog for I'm going to shag your hard drive. Now, that in itself is bad. And people might say, well, he must be really clever to write a computer virus. I'd say maybe not, because it didn't just print that message. You see, he says he wants to have a job by the end of the month. And to help him in that aim, what it also printed out was his, was his full CV with phone number and contact details as well. So, evil genius? Definitely not a genius. Here's a guy, I can't tell you his name, uh, and I've had to pixelate out his eyes. We haven't got a picture of him. He is a member of the Syrian Electronic Army. This is a pro-Assad hacking group based in Syria. They have a history of hacking into news organizations, causing trouble. Um, they once hacked into Jon Snow. Remember Jon Snow was on Channel 4 News? They hacked into the Channel 4 News website and they posted a message talking about nuclear arms going off uh, in the Middle East. All kinds of mischief like that. But one of the things they did was they tried to make money. And they tried to make money by stealing data, rather like lots of ransomware gangs do today, and then getting it sent to them. But these were really the days before cryptocurrency. So they had to transfer the money somehow to these hackers in Syria because they faced this problem, which was sanctions. You couldn't easily move money to where the hackers were. But the hackers kept on demanding money. Here's one of their demands. And they negotiated, in this case, down to 7,500. And what they said is, look, it's going to be hard for you to send us money but we have intermediaries around the world, including a guy uh, in China, Russia, Germany. You could speak to them. And they said, there's a guy you can contact in Germany. His name is Pierre Romar. He lives in a central uh, town in Germany called Wolterhausen. And here is his Gmail address. Contact him, transfer the money to him, and he will get it to us in Syria. And then you can have your data back and we won't release it to the rest of the world. Now, I've worked in some large companies in my time, 
And the biggest problem I've faced when working inside a large company has actually been the legal team, the legal department. Because I would always be trying to do something and they'd say, oh, you can't do that for health and safety reasons or someone's going to get maimed, Graham. Or, you know, that's technically illegal what you want to do. And I'm like, for goodness sake, you're just stopping me from doing my job. But all the time they were stopping me from doing fun things, with things which I consider fun. And what may surprise you is that when companies actually get hacked, when companies are being extorted for money, quite often the legal team comes on board to help with the negotiations. And that's what happened in this particular case. The legal team came along and they said, well, we're going to need some reassurances from this guy that if we pay him the money, we're going to get our data back. And so they wrote a contract. And they sent the contract to Pierre Romar. I presume that's not his real name. You know, it's obviously some sort of pseudonym. We send this contract to him. And what we'll do is we'll ask him to sign the contract. And all we need from him is his name, address, scan of his passport. And sure enough, that's what the hacker did. So you have to ask yourself, <laughs> are they... Are these guys really geniuses? No, they're not geniuses. Um, many of these guys aren't. And the truth is, they don't need to be geniuses. Because so often we make it easy for them to commit these kind of crimes. That's the sad truth. They don't have to be geniuses to hack our organizations. Are they evil? Well, they may not all be bad. I think we've seen some examples of people who, I find it hard to say that anyone is truly bad uh, unless they have a moustache or unless they're a, an animated paperclip. Um, are they geniuses? Well, they may not be smart. They may not be either of these things. Um, people do bad things. And everyone does dumb things from time to time. So I think maybe what we need to do is stop just separating people into evil and genius, but create another category, which I like to call wombats. And wombats, that probably includes a lot of us, actually. Maybe a lot of us are actually wombats. Because stupidity, you know, we're all stupid sometimes. We can all make mistakes. Accidents happen. People, including people in IT security departments, right? None of us should think that we are immune from making mistakes. We shouldn't look down on the people who don't work 100% in IT security. The truth is we're all part of IT security really because we're all clicking on a link, opening attachments, deciding whether we trust a website to enter our passwords on. We're making those kind of decisions all of the time. None of us should be so arrogant to think that we wouldn't possibly make a mistake as well. And to give you an example, the University of East Anglia. They have a department, the School of Art, Media and American Studies. In 2017, they suffered a bit of a snafu. They, uh, one of their members of staff sent out a spreadsheet to basically all of the students containing the details of some 298 students inside that particular division of the university. And the spreadsheet included sensitive information. It was all about reasons why people may have done badly in exams, you know, extenuating circumstances. So there was some really sad stuff in there and sensitive stuff about people's family situation. There was also stuff about people who had been the victims of sexual assault in the run-up to exams and extenuating circumstances, um, whether people had suicidal thoughts, personal traumas, et cetera, et cetera, all in a spreadsheet which was sent to everybody. This is the email down here, the spreadsheet, which was sent to everybody. So anyone could read that. Up above, which I think is just uh, 13 minutes later, is the classic, I would like to recall that email. And we've all seen that email, we've all seen that message, haven't we? So, so and so would like to recall an email. If there's anything that's going to get you to open an email, it's that message saying, can we recall that last one? And then they, they really, really underlined it. They sent a separate email saying, you might have received an email with a spreadsheet attachment. Please, please delete that without opening and reading it. Which I'm afraid just means people are going to open and read it. 
So these kind of accidents can happen to anyone. And you know, there but for the grace of God go all of us. In this particular case, the reason why that was sent to everyone was it was meant to be sent to one staff member. It should have been password protected anyway, and it wasn't. Well, that particular tab should have been removed, but it was the auto uh, complete inside the email client, which sent it to a different mailing list rather than an individual. And so they just clicked on return and boom, off it went. So none of us can afford to be in our ivory towers and think that this kind of thing doesn't affect us. None of us are immune from this kind of thing. So we have to keep our eyes open from all of these kind of mistakes. And it's really difficult. I know some of us are working remotely. Some of us have got all kinds of distractions. We're all busy. We've got kids screaming at us. We've got our partners telling us to go and unload the dishwasher. Phones going off, multiple Zoom calls. We're trying to juggle our calendar all the time. It's like, oh my God, I've got to do all these things and I've got to, I'm on my phone now and I'm trying to accept this meeting request. And you're clicking on links and you're entering passwords. Accidents happen. So let's not be too arrogant to think that it can't happen to us. Let's not be too churlish and think that the people who fall for these things are idiots as well, because we are ultimately, I think, all wombats. Thank you very much. I do do a weekly podcast where I tell stories about cybersecurity screw ups, about how you can better protect yourself on the phone, about how you can do online banking and online commerce safer. We try and make it fun. We try and make, I, there was some serious stuff in there, but we try and have a bit of a laugh as well. So check out Smashing Security. If any of you would like a sticker, I have a small number of stickers left over. But thank you very much. It's been great and enjoy the rest of your evening and the rest of the conference.